This is Women's Leadership Success.com Radio, episode number 65. Imagine you are from China. You studied to be a diplomat, but through unexpected events found yourself a political dissident who was sent to a factory for re education. And yet you made the difficult journey to get to the United States and there founded a multi-million dollar business. Think this is impossible? This is a true story. Join us today and hear how Mei Shui made this journey from extreme challenge to becoming a top woman leader. Listen and learn three insider secrets from Mei Shui to help you succeed in your business, career, and leadership. This is one of my all-time favorite interviews. I hope you are as inspired and motivated by it as I am. Welcome to Women's Leadership Podcast, showing you how to influence people, improve your performance, and advance your career. Brought to you by women's leadership and career expert Sabrina Brom and womensleadershipsuccess.com. Here's your chance to meet women trendsetters leading the way to success, accomplishment, and balance in business and life. No matter if you're a manager, CEO, or entrepreneur, join Sabrina for coaching and no-nonsense advice to improve your career and bottom line. This is Sabrina Brahm with Women's Leadership Success Radio. Today we're talking to Mei Shi. She is the co-founder and CEO of Pacific Trade International, a fully integrated global innovator of home fragrance, fragrance technology, and home decor products. Her brands include the Chesapeake Bay Candle, synonymous with stylish design and unique nature-inspired fragrances. She also is the, has the brand Alasis, an exclusive collection of fragrances inspired by sophisticated early Mediterranean civilizations, cultures, and gardens. Welcome, Mei Shui. Thank you, Sabrina, for inviting me back. You're welcome, and I, I, have to, I feel like I... Um, I didn't do justice to Alasis. Can you tell us just a little bit about that before we go on to the questions? Um, over the last 20 years, I have always traveled to sort of be inspired by the native fragrances and the cultures. Um, one of the things I wanted to do is to create a collection that really is very high-end and exclusive and give the experience of fragrance as it's in the early civilizations of the Mediterranean region, what we call the cradle of civilization of fragrance. And we came up with the name Alasis because it sounds very Mediterranean and the fragrances are um, very inspired from that region. And it has been um, very successful at Bloomingdale and other high-end boutiques and internationally. In fact, recently, our holiday fragrance, Noble Fur, has been ranked number two of the best holiday candles by Time Country Magazine. So I'm very glad about this new brand that is uh, launching uh, globally for us. Wonderful. You know, we last interviewed you in 2009. It was almost six years ago. And I understand now that you're having your 20th anniversary at your company. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. In September, we celebrated in style and in um, what has always inspired us um, at the Chesapeake Bay. We kicked it off with a theme called Back to the Bay because it's for the first time, not only do we bring jobs back to the Bay, but we also brought a collection called Back to the Bay under Chesapeake Bay Candle, which has very simple and pure fragrance collections and um, stylistically really pay tributes to our origin as a company. Beautiful. And I understand that you kn- you have a new factory in Glen Burnie, Maryland. It's your first factory in the United States. Can you tell us how you made this decision and why it was important for you to do this? That was a very good question. Um, I'm still thinking back about that particular journey. To me, Everything is a journey, and this journey back to the United States uh, was not an easy one, literally and uh, financially and emotionally, because Maryland is not uh, a a particular state that welcomes those jobs. 
Um, I think that they will be very happy if it's a cyber security job or it's a job that produces uh, high-tech biological medical equipment. Um, when we want to bring jobs and build a factory of candles, um, we went into a lot of hurdles. The reason we want it back is threefold. Number one, um, in 2007 and 2008, just as the United States and the rest of the world entered into uh, economic crisis, the product that we, are, we were making out of Asia is actually um, getting a huge cost increase thanks to two decades of um, growth in Asia, particularly in China. Um, finally, the labor cost is uh, catching up with the living standard, and you see double-digit growth in labor costs every year in China. Even though we were producing in Vietnam, China sneezed and the rest of the countries around them will get a big cold. So when China had double-digit uh, salary increase, the rest of the countries around them, uh, labor-wise, all increases even more because they're relatively smaller countries. So we had an increase of cost while we, are, we were in the middle of a recession, which is a very uh, ironic situation because our retail customers are asking us to give them a cost reduction because they couldn't sell products fast enough. The second reason we were thinking uh, to move out of Asia at that time was also because even though um, there was a recession, China was still growing at over 8% every year. And they alone pushed commodity prices, including uh, oil prices, very high. And oil is what um, is the main component for our wax product, as well as for our international transportation costs. So our shipping costs between ocean line to inland travels are very expensive. The last reason I think is the main sort of um, uh, tipping point is when we realized that it took us three months to start a new product launch out of Asia, seven weeks to get reorders of the same product out of Asia. Our competitors in this country would shorten that by half just by being in this country. As we were in the con uh, middle of a recession, retailers were very cautious about inventory. They order very uh, small amount. They rely on turnaround of inventory. So go to market wise, it makes a perfect sense to be uh, here in the United States to be able to respond to market needs. So when when you look at these three reasons, the cost of labor, the cost of uh, transportation, and the speed to market, we decided that it's time to look at manufacturing in the U.S. So how has that worked out? In the end, um, as uh, people in the uh, Asian society say, uh, it all goes. It will always be well in the end. If it's not well, it's not the end. So we're at the end because it's all well now. But in the beginning, I never see that it will ever be well because to start, um, we have a very big bureaucracy in our state where. For 20 years, they have not had a permit for factory. When we went to our Anne Arundel County for a permit office uh, to guide us on what permit we need to apply for and the regulations that related to manufacturing, they look at us as if we have three heads, and they said, we never have to give one in the last 20 years. So the, the codes are not here, but... Here's a book, and we're talking about a yellow page thick book. Here's a book for codes for a hospital, and here's one for restaurants, and this is the one for a school. Combine all three of them, and maybe you'll be close to open a factory. Oh, my gosh. Literally, that, this is what we were told by one person who is not uh, going to be named, who basically has the honor of walking us through what is basically a maze of regulations and uh, demands to open a facility, not a factory, but a facility. Wow. I'm, I'm, and, and now you're successful. I'm just wondering, um, is there some advice for people that might be going through this as entrepreneurs? 
what advice would you give them when they when they hit roadblocks like that where basically someone's saying this is almost impossible? What would you say to it them? Is, yeah. Well, Sabrina, I think that we are very persistent lots. We're very steady. When people tell us no, we kind of get excited and we want to show them that it's a yes. <laughs> but the financials uh, are very hard. Um, to open a factory, for example, is not something that entrepreneurs should try because the capital investment is huge. That's why um, most of the entrepreneurs these days are in the technology field. They are working out of their home, uh, making things out of their garage. By the time they make it to the factory, some of them outsource that, right? Um, so there are a lot of candle manufacturing OEM companies that makes candles that you and I would know in a beautiful store, decorated well, and at a very high price. Why? Because they're not made by the people that design them and make them uh, with the fragrances. So for the entrepreneurs, I think that they need to look at opportunities where things are a little bit less complicated. They should really find their niche where they can execute, where they have control of the end result and end pricing so that they don't have to rely on all these uh, regulatory you know, hurdles. Um, for example, our business, the candle business, is very highly regulated because it's a flammable product. Uh, every year there are more and more regulations uh, regarding candles, uh, not only just candles but the components as well as the, the wick, um, the fragrance. They all have certain requirements in case um, it's accidentally consumed by anything between cats and dogs or some people have uh, allergies to certain um, you know, fragrance oils. So we have to take a whole range of um, regulatory issues into consideration. We have a person whose job is to keep up with the, with the regulations. And um, because, as you know, we are selling to all states in this country, and a lot of things are starting from your dear dear state, Sabrina of California. Uh huh. When California make a demand, we all listen very carefully. <laughs> um, and that's why doing business in California can be a little bit more daunting than elsewhere. Right. And I, I want to go back to the factory in Glen Burnie because. You mentioned how many employees did you start out with, and how many do you have now? And I want to first, of, I want to first of all, Sabrina, mention to you that the reason why we finally make the decision and the map to come back on the the three reasons is that we also have a solution of using a highly automated machine. Um, we have been very heavily making product by hand because we can using the Asian labor force. But our product has shifted from um, mainly handmade products to potentially fillable by machines. We're talking about the difference of uh, novelty or pillar candles to glass-filled candles, where you see many, many products are made in, by this country, right? Mm -hmm. So when we make those shift of our categories, it's possible to look at automation and automation is what makes our product compatible in this marketplace. So the, the math of having the number of people working to produce the same amount of product, it, it's not the same as those in Asia. The machine we uh, eventually purchase is very effective. So we are able now to make close to uh, 800,000 candles a month with only 100 people, sometimes less. Wow. Um, on two shifts, not even three shifts. And um, because we are very good at timing when a shift starts, we stagger our team. So when we pour candles, we may not have the entire team. We just have the mixing team and quality control team start. And then, you know, 7.30, the rest of the team come because then the candle travel down the assembly line is cooled off enough to um, start packaging, labeling, all these final uh, processes. So we really crafted our process to very efficient um, management of uh, resources that is important in our business. So um, that's how many people we have. We started with about 15 people, 
um, about um, 15 to 20, I would say five or more in the in the front end, managing the you know information technology, POs uh, calling trucks to pick up that kind of thing. Now we have uh, close to 80 in the factory, and then back end, which is the office, is about uh, 15 to 20 people. Wow. And you, you mentioned you've come full circle. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, Sabrina, when I came here, I was uh, going to be a student uh, focusing on diplomacy, working. Uh, my dream job would have been working for the World Bank to help poor countries when they receive um, funds from the bank to help the population understand uh, what the investment means to them, and also for the bank to understand from an anthropology perspective how the fund can be better utilized by each country. Sometimes the bank make very arrogant mistakes, thinking that people all over the world want exactly the same thing. But as you and I know, every culture uh, has values on different things, and we need to listen to them and let them make certain decisions as well. That was my thing about uh, being ambassador of culture and an ambassador for poor countries who has needs beyond rich country can understand. Um, we're not in any position to enforce how the money should be uh, spent, in my opinion, just because we we think that we know better. Um, I think we need to be understanding more before we decide. But that didn't happen because we were in a Kuwait war. Um, we were fighting against the Iran, Iraqs with, uh, in Kuwait, and the United States did not make its uh, funding available to the World Bank. And that, as a result of that, I was not hired that year. I graduated um, with a master's degree. Um, so I went out on my own to look for a job, and the job was not my favorite thing in New York. I decided uh, after many days of window shopping at Bloomingdale to do something with my sort of creative side, which is design and um, home. So I quit my job in 1994 and started a business uh, with my then husband, David, in the basement of our home. And uh, it happened to be a, a, a overnight hit, I would say. Um, I still cannot believe how successful we, we were right away. And uh, we started a product manufacturing in China uh, because at that time in the 90s, China was on fire in terms of uh, foreign trade. For the first time, they were utilizing their labor force and the creativity, but also the hunger of all the people in China into something, I mean, it's a miracle. We call it the factory of the world for a good reason. They manufacture everything that we use in our home, mm -hmm. and they were hungry, and they were going out of their way to make it happen. So we were riding on a very high wave. And then came the reality that, um, you know, China finally, after 30 years of growth from the 80s all the way to 2000 and 2010, their rising, um, you know, middle class is demanding more demanding more salary, demanding better living conditions, demanding better environment, and they realize a lot of their economy has been depending on very heavily labor-driven polluting industry, and they sort of want to shut those down. And um, so that is where Vietnam came, and that's where India came, and a lot of other countries picked up the businesses, Pakistan, uh, um, you know, all these other Asian countries picked up the pieces. And that's where we moved our factory to Vietnam because of that. But as we were talking about the, the economic uh, recession in the 2008 and 2009, we recognized that, you know, to really make a fundamental change to our business model, we have to focus on our, our quality, on our brand, and on our service to our customers. And those three things really called out for a destination that is closer to our headquarters, that we can synergize our creativity here in Rockville and our sales team to better understand the demand of production, better utilize our production, and really make much better product in the end. And and now you're, you're actually exporting back to China, is that correct? 
we are on the verge of doing that. China's uh, importing business is uh, is booming, but they also have very demanding um, sort of uh, regulations on items that has cosmetic or slash fragrance oil components. So we are going through that hurdle, and we hope to be able to work with a successful distributor um, by next year. But we are in Korea. We are in um, Europe. We we will be very soon in um, um, Dubai, and we have been uh, requested information in Japan, which hopefully we will soon work with. And we are also exporting to Mexico and Canada. Wow, that's that's amazing. You know, having talked to you before, and when I listen to you right now, the and I hear how you set up this factory in um, Glen Burnie, the skill sets you have now are are really different than you had when you started the company 20 years ago. And for the women that are listening to this program who are business women and entrepreneurs, can you can you tell us something about that progression or things that you've learned over the years or what what helped you to grow and keep up with with the development of this company? That's a very interesting question. I think at the end of the day, I'm a very curious person. Um, that's what got me into doing things that I wasn't trained for. I think that I'm always competing with my sons on who knows what. Um, you know, my son would ask me questions like, do you know why the wine is called Pia Noir? And I would have no answer for that, right? Um, you know, boys in their age of teenagers, they always want to outsmart you. But I think what they do sort of, end up teaching me is the wonder of being just a curious person. So to me, it's not a sort of trying to educate myself every day. It's just trying to learn from everyone around you. Um, Sandra, who is sitting here with me, uh, is someone you have been talking to. She came from a world that I really respect, um, you know, in the Discovery Channel that she used to work for. You discover everything every day. You discover wonders by nature. You discover things that the animals do, and you find yourself growing just by being, you know, putting yourself in that position to let others educate you. So I know zero about um, manufacturing, but uh, I have to deal with the bureaucracies and four different uh, firms, one architecture firm, a fire engineering firm, uh, industrial um, sort of installation firm, and I think also our factory in Germany that designed and made our candle manufacturing, um, you know, fa uh, machine. So I know I know none of these four things. But to me, it's it's fascinating when the German engineers come. I remember how precise he is. He said, "May let, uh, can can you give me an average height person?" I said, "What? Why do you ask that question?" He said, well, because you are kind of short, and I know that your worker will be a little bit taller than you. I want to make sure that our assembly line is going to be built with everyone in mind. And I was laughing. I said, you know, what you said is going to be called discrimination. You know that, right? <laughs> so he was, he was laughing. He said, I'm pretty sure this is going to be a much more comfortable assembly line for your team. So you learn everything. And this kind of learning sometimes is... Um, it's just being able to open yourself to others' ideas and and be able to raise questions. Uh, I raise a lot of questions about financing, about regulations. Uh, why should we do things that way? Can we do it the other way? So I think that kind of uh, curiosity and uh, uh, the ability to raise questions, even though it sounds ridiculous, sometimes in the middle of a lot of people, um, it is um, what entrepreneurs need to do because we are very different. Not many people can be an entrepreneur simply because they want to start a business. Entrepreneur can be a very lonely business. It can be a very daring business. It can also be a very um, sort of patient business. You know, you don't really become successful as as you want to be overnight. Sometimes... Just when you think you cannot possibly give this business more is the day that you become successful. And a lot of times, you know, you, you, are, you, are, you need to be resourceful by asking people 
that has been successful questions over and over, and sometimes you need to challenge them, and you don't need to trust everybody. You just need to listen to yourself to say, this is the right path. Nobody around me supported me about a factory here. In fact, there are still people within the organization that thinks we are probably putting too much resources into the factory where we should focusing on design and marketing and selling. And my ultimate answer to them is that, don't you love it that you're able to put a product that you're proud of that is so uh, good quality and you can get the price you want? We are selling candles in the past that cost $15 retail, 20 the most. Now, I mean, we're selling a $60, $60 candle, a $45 candle. We're going to introduce a a $90 candle the next round of Alasis. And we're not going to be ashamed of that because we know the quality stands for itself. So I think the skills I learned are many. Number one is managing the brand. I learned that I didn't manage the brand very well, that I let it go everywhere it can go, and it backfired. Number two, we need to manage financials. You know, I didn't come from a financial background, but I taught myself the P&Ls. You know, I taught myself how to really um, understand costs, understand particularly manufacturing costs. It's very uh, labor-intensive. You need to break down, uh, you know, what is the packaging team's cost, what is the uh, pouring team's cost, so that you can see a better picture of what your costs come from. And you need to understand tax. You need to understand depreciations and all these financial jargons. But it's also sometimes going out there to say, you know, this is such a weak spot of me. I actually want to get educated. So recently I have been uh, nominated to sit on the board of a publicly traded bank. And you would think that's the farthest thing that May wants to be is to be on the public traded bank mm-hmm. uh, board, not only because of Dodd-Frank, you know, all these uh, regulations regarding compensation and pay, but also banking industry is going through financial and uh, systematic change that is profound. Um, all the regulations are aiming at the bank because of the financial crisis. And why do I want to be on that board? Because I know nothing about how they operate. I don't know where they make the income, where is their margin coming from, what, how do they make decisions on lending, how do they make decisions on consumer loans, how do they make decisions on buying a company. And to me, this is interesting. So rather than thinking that you know it's going to be uh, taking time away from me, I learned so much from them that benefit this company in, in the end. So well, I think we have to have that learning spirit. The learning spirit and and the willingness to just embark on something that you know nothing about and learn everything you can that you're going to be able to synthesize into what you're already doing, right? I, I hope so. Um, recently I went uh, to the New York Stock Exchange director's training and there's just a maze of amount of information that really benefit everybody in business. You know, it, it, it comes from how to improve your social media presence to uh, how do you talk to investors, which is not different than talking to your constituents or your consumers. You know, there's very fundamental principles that apply to a lot of things. And I think that um, it, it's, a, it's a great uh, experience for me to, to receive that kind of education. Um, it's great. And, and it's it's a really wonderful attitude that you're just always open to learning new things. These, you know, just that humble uh, willingness to learn something you don't know. Um, we're we're getting close to running out of time, which is you know, you, you, we could talk for hours because you you've got so much to share with with uh, the women listening. But I'm wondering if you could tell us something about how social media has uh, has helped you and how, how it could help women develop their careers? Well, this is probably one area I'm going to learn <laughs> more. Um, I have been a little bit shy on social media, perhaps because, you know, in a way, I'm a little bit more old-schooled in the sense of putting the business and my personal life a little bit separate. One of the things about social media is you need to be willing to put yourself out there for 
uh, tweeting, for Facebook, for Instagram, and not only for the sake of your company, but really make it personal. And I have not been able to make that big jump, I have to say, um, also because, you know, most of the time I like to touch things. You know, to me, if it's, if it's not tactile, it's not real. So I like to smell things. I'm, I'm yet to discover a way to let people touch fragrance from the website. Um, that's one thing that intrigues me. Um, how do we let people experience fragrances at their fingertips? Um, these are things that excite me. But back to social media, I think that we as a company has kind of fly under the radar most of, most of our uh, career, most of our life. And one of our mandate, uh, and I'm very happy to say that it's going to be a mandate, is as a company we want to really embrace social media. We want to have more customers that are uh, e-commerce driven. We want to uh, really get to know our consumers better by conducting more uh, online and um, in-depth consumer insight. And we want to really reward our loyal customers with you know, experiences that they couldn't buy elsewhere. So I think that as a, a forward-looking strategy, this is something that, um, stay tuned, Sabrina, two, two years later, maybe you'll see us everywhere on social media. Well, that's good. And also, when you I, I, I buy your candles, and they're wonderful. And I normally don't like fragrances, but they're, they're mild, they're pleasant, they're wonderful. And when you mentioned these new products, I thought, wow, I wish there was a way that I could smell them quickly. Exactly. You know? So and that wouldn't it, wouldn't it be magic if I just mentioned the name and everybody listening could smell it? It, it, would. it would. It would be would, just great. It um, would be great. So, what books and periodicals are you reading right now? Well, um, this is a very good question, but I have always been finding Financial Times to be one of the most interesting newspapers that I cannot still get rid of. You know, I'm, I'm trying to stay paperless, and I like the just the old-fashioned way of reading the, 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 um, the, the story. And then recently, a friend of mine introduced me a very good book. It's called Far From the Tree. Uh, it celebrates children. You know the, 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 the phrase, uh, the, the apples are not are falling not far from the tree. Uh -huh. But this book is celebrating children that are born with a certain needs. They're either deaf, or they're uh, blind, or they, they're um, autistic. Um, to me, it's a very emotional thing to read because I have so many friends that have that kind of a child that is far from the tree. And it helps me to understand the needs of um, the, the emotional world of those children are not necessarily what we think it is. And the more we understand them, the more we will give them a, a life that is happy, that is not conforming to what we want, but to what they want. And um, because I'm working very closely with the Children's Hospital, and that's a book I want to recommend them also, and to see if we all can sort of get on the side of um, not to think what I, a kid that is far from the tree needs versus the parents that has one of those children need. Um, it's a very it's a very interesting book. That, that I'm sounds reading. interesting. I'm going to get it. And um, on the on our uh, when your radio program's up, there will be an updated biography of you. And when people when the women listening look at what you're involved in, one of the things that is so incredible about you is how much compassion you have for people and how much you help others. Um, and and that that book is is a, a sample of that. Um, I I want to end the show with this is our this will be our first show of the new year, and so uh, people listening they will they will be starting the new year with uh, hearing this interview, and I wonder if you can give them some advice or some some way to think about this new year or the new beginning that's coming up. Thank you for putting us in the new year. I'm always uh, very enchanted when the new year comes and everyone wants to make New Year's resolution. And I think that for women, particularly, um, taking care of ourselves is one of the most 
important advice I want to give. Because we always say if we have a happy mother, we have a happy family. And if we have a happy women boss, we'll have a happy company. So I think that taking care of ourselves, our emotional and our health, uh, our personal needs is very important. Most of us don't. We always take care of everyone else. And that's wrong. In the long term, it's going to make us not as affectionate, not as happy, and it's going to show. So taking care of ourselves and making that the number one commitment to ourselves is what I want everybody to remember. The second thing is, I think, um, to really stand up for something. Um, I think we have a lot of uh, decisions to make in our lives. Sometimes we got um, a lot of white noises out there, and we lost uh, the inner self to make a decision. Um, a lot of times we are swinged by, you know, noises on the radio, noises on, you know, in our in our neighborhood, and we decided that we forgot what we want. So I think in the coming up elections, which we're going to see a lot of elections, we have to stand up for ourselves because no one else will. I'll guarantee you that. Um, the last thing I think is to be curious. This has carried me that far, um, to have a very open heart and a very open mind, because between the mind and the heart, there's not much we cannot accomplish. That is beautiful. And, I, you, and you said something earlier, a, a Chinese saying, you said, in the end, all will be well, and if it is not well, it is not the end. Exactly. And then to to um, have one last quote from Buddha that really sort of gave me a chill, thinking that it's it's connected to my work. I want to say for the new year, I want everyone to remember: a candle loses nothing by lighting up another. Oh, that is so beautiful. Could you say that one more time? A candle loses nothing by lighting up another. Beautiful. And what a what a beautiful way to start the new year to have you um share your your wisdom and and just who you are with all of us. So thank you so much for being part of our program. Thank you Sabrina for remembering us and cheer on to all the listeners who um want to be successful, strive every day to be successful both as a mother, a wife, and just a single woman that is out there fighting for herself. So cheers to all of them. Thank you, and Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Bye. Wasn't that a great interview? Did this spark any new ideas for you as a leader or entrepreneur? Please share your discoveries and opinions with us. Go to www.womensleadershipsuccess.com and post your comments at the bottom of the show. And be sure to join our Women's Leadership Success Group on Facebook and help us build an active community of women and men committed to helping each other succeed. Thanks for listening. Thank you for joining your host, Sabrina Brahm, on another Women's Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email her at sabrina at sabrinabrahm.com. Since 1989, Sabrina and her team have helped hundreds of women managers, business leaders, and entrepreneurs with valuable trainings, articles, books, and executive coaching. For additional tips, interviews, and free access to Great Leaders Today mini-course, visit www.womensleadershipsuccess.com.